Hi, and thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Birkenstock. I was a PhD student here in aeronautics and astronautics from 2004 to 2009-ish. <laughs> it got a little That's confusing a at the end there. Oh yeah, God. not quite sure what was happening. Um, just for a quick intro so everyone knows, we've got Ching Yu Hu, Hi. another co-founder who was in ms &E. We've got John Fennick, who was in the business school, and we've got Julian Mann. Um, before we get started, maybe just a little bit of sort of know your audience. So how many people here today are engineers? Good. All right, good. Good. How, how many people in the business school? All right. All right. That's pretty Represent. cool. Represent. Yeah. Represent. Yeah. Here you go, John. Not bad. A few. Not bad. Um, how many people are here today because they want to start a company? Oh, that's good. Yeah. Skybox doesn't work. We got a lot of backup options yeah. to go, uh, there you go. find here. And um, finally, before <laughs> the announcement went out for this ETL lecture, how many people had ever heard of Skybox Imaging? That's what I expected. Not very many. So um, we're excited to be here today to tell you a little bit more about our company, in large part because people don't really know us yet. We've been at this thing for a little while, um, but we're still in kind of a soft stealth mode as we get up into the launch of our first products and satellites later this year. So to tell you a little bit more and kind of get everybody up to speed before we get into the fun stuff, we at Skybox Imaging have been around for about four years. We incorporated in 2009. We've raised $91 million, which is kind of a lot of money, it feels like, for a company that most people haven't heard of. Um, we've got six months to the launch of our first satellite, SkySat-1. We've got a, a pretty awesome team. We started off by hiring all of our best friends from Stanford, and we've just kind of kept going from there. And at this point, we've got people that have worked on a, really a very interesting variety of space missions and big data companies here in Silicon Valley. And our vision at Skybox, as we'll talk about a lot more today, is to uh, dramatically increase the overall size of what we like to call the overhead monitoring market. So how are we going to do that? Well, at Skybox, we, we build satellites that are about the size of a small refrigerator and are built using commercial, off-the-shelf electronics, open source software, and really all the other tricks of the trade that have made Silicon Valley scalable. You know, commoditized hardware, agile development, all these types of things. Now, in order to really create that new market of tomorrow, we want to be able to monitor tens or even hundreds of thousands of locations on Earth on a daily basis. The only way to do that is to put up lots of satellites. The only way to put up lots of satellites is to put up very low cost satellites. We've spent the last four years designing very low cost satellites that can still provide images that are attractive to the market of today as we create the market of tomorrow. And these images look like this. So you can see an airplane, you can see a shipping container, you can see a car, you can see uh, railroad cars, you can see really objects of the scale that move around you know, the surface of our earth on a daily basis and heavily inform uh, ac economic activity and then also the, the security of nations around our planet. You can't see a license plate, you can't see a person, and you really can't even tell, oh, it's John's car versus Julian's car versus Ching Yu's car. I don't know if John actually has a car, so that probably makes it easier. <laughs> um, in addition, by taking advantage of sort of the Silicon Valley approach to building satellites, we got a, a pretty interesting side benefit that our satellites don't just produce imagery, they produce video as well. And so we'll be marketing the, the world's first high resolution video from space that we hope pe will help people gain a much better insight on a daily basis into how things are happening across our, uh, off, across our world. What's exciting to us, though, is not just the imagery, it's not just the video, it's being able to sort of move beyond what you might see in Google Maps or Bing Maps today, and being able to provide the data the answer to the question. Not just the picture of the parking lot, but an answer for how many cars are within it. And how does that compare to what happened last week, last month, last year? And how do we roll that up onto a global scale? So that for the first time, we really can put an information source in the hands of consumers, businesses, and governments around the world that can dramatically increase their ability to um, make uh, 
efficient, profitable, and safe decisions as they go about their daily lives. So that's, that's the elevator pitch. Now, for those of you who are taking 273, I know you're all practicing elevator pitches. When we took 273, they actually made us get in an elevator with someone on the first floor of Terman and give them the elevator pitch by the time we got to the fourth floor. So now that we've had four years to hone it, you know, we've been able to spend a lot of time perfecting that. But what I think is really interesting for us is all the tough lessons that we've learned as we uh, got outside the building and decided that we were actually going to build a company called Skybox Imaging, which today is over 80 people, has invested tens of millions of dollars, has developed a significant amount of technology, and quite frankly, still hasn't proven itself. Uh, still has a very long way to go um, in the cycle of really being able to make it happen. So we'll start off with kind of the actual backstory on Skybox, which isn't on our website and doesn't go in the slides. In 2007, I was in my three or four-ish year of my PhD when uh, Google uh, actually announced something called the Google Lunar X Prize. So this was a $20 million prize for a commercial team that could land a rover on the surface of the moon, which could drive around, take pictures, and send back the data. Now, having spent a lot of time in what we called the Hurt Locker, any, any Aero Astro students here? All right, we got a couple. So this was actually the old Hurt Locker. I'm kind of dating myself now. But we had a, a bunch of people that really were in our, our friend circle and had either worked on CubeSats, which are bread box sized satellites uh, that use commercial electronics, an approach with, that was invented here at Stanford about a decade ago to dramatically reduce the price point of doing business in space. We also had people that were good at software, they were good at mechanical design, that were good at optics, that were good at, um, ironically, program management in some cases. And it, in looking around, it seemed like this might be something we could do at Stanford. Stanford had won the DARPA Grand Challenge a couple years before, and this seemed like sort of a, a, a moonshot you know, of a, of a follow-on program. Uh, we had 40 students that were all gung-ho on making this happen. We were thinking about initial high-level designs you know, and, and really being able to take this approach that, that had been sort of developed and fleshed out over the last decade to build CubeSats and applying that same design approach to a moon mission. Um, unfortunately, as I'm sure many of you remember, the winter of 2007-2008 wasn't really the best time to try and get new initiatives started that were going to cost tens of millions of dollars. The complete economy collapsed uh, out from under us, and you know, some of the soft offers that we had had for, for potential financing for this thing dissipated overnight. So. Um, I think we learned one of the most important lessons at that point that we've carried with us over the last four years now, and that's really sort of a, a rugged determination. Um, even after the universe told us no by letting, you know, creating the, the worst financial crisis in nearly 100 years, and we said to ourselves, look, we're at Stanford where all these amazing companies are founded. Sand Hill Road, where the venture capitalists are, is you know, a mile and a half away. We have this really unique group of people that have this idea of how do we take sort of the, the things that have made commercial success in Silicon Valley and made it scalable and cost effective and inject that into aerospace for the first time. Um, and so we just started pulling on that thread. Uh, we started out as a technology looking for a market, you know, which I'm sure is a common theme in a number of these lectures. Uh, and we had a technical paper at a conference, we came back, we got one introduction to one venture capitalist. We walked into his office with four awful slides and a sort of prototype of what we thought a satellite could eventually look like. And um, he said, you know, this is pretty cool, but you guys have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, there's this class, MS&E 273, go take it. Um, and that was some of the best advice we ever got. So we came back to Stanford for that school year. We took MS&E 273. We had the opportunity to get outside the building, to really to make use of the fact that we were still Stanford students. It's amazing the response you get from people when you cold call uh, you know, a, a value-added reseller of satellite imagery in Anchorage, Alaska, and tell them, oh, hi, my name's Dan. I'm a Stanford student. We're working on a project. Can I get 10 minutes of your time? Right? And so we started out just kind of pushing, pushing, pushing on trying to understand the market of today developing out you know, the business plan, putting together a pitch. And then 
You know, we never really talked about it, but somehow we all just knew deep down that we were going to go out and incorporate, and we were going to try and make this thing a reality. And so after the class finished, um, you know, January, I think, 15th, you know, we worked with the attorney we had met in the class to put in place the documentation to actually have a, a registered company. And at that point, you, know, you go out, you buy the GoDaddy domain, you get your email address set up, you put that signature line in there, and, and you send yourself an email. And it's like the coolest thing ever. You know, like, I just got an email from myself at my own company. right? <laughs> and it felt like a company at the time, which is funny, because it wasn't a company at all. It was just four of us hanging out in John's living room with his cats that scratched everything, <laughs> including Ching Yu's face yeah, and Julian's was. arms and all of our MacBook Pros. Right? And so, uh, so from there, it, you know, it felt like a company. We had our Monday morning meetings. We still have Monday morning meetings today. There are more people at them. But you know, we set out our action items, and we went after trying to do them and trying to improve our story. And we started looking around for introductions to people that might be interested in financing something as um, uh, different as an enterprise that involved satellites. right? And so, uh, as I'm sure many of you have already seen and know, Stanford has an amazing set of resources to help get you out there and to actually talk to people that can make these things a reality. And so, you know, we spent for six and a half months, we spent at least two days a week doing three pitches a day to over 50 different venture capital firms. We, I had more lattes at Koopa Cafe then I will ever be able to detox out of my system for the rest of my life. <laughs> and um, and you know, we'd, we'd get to the third pitch of the day, and we'd all be so slap happy that we'd just, it'd be like throwing a football back and forth. We'd all deliver each other's lines, right? And we just honed it, and worked it, and pushed it, and called more customers, and met more people, and asked for more introductions. And uh, eventually, we got uh, introduced to Vinod Kosla, and we went and gave a pitch at Kosla Ventures which um, after uh, you know, a lot of digging and, and fact checking, uh, turned into a, a $3 million Series A, which allowed us to move out of John's living room into uh, what we thought was an amazing 2,100 square foot office that had a nice little machine shop in the back with carpet on the ground in a conference room, but which felt like a real company. Um, and from there, we, learned, uh, we, we began learning about not just how you sell the company, but how you build the company. And one of the most telling points on that was as we walked in for our first board of directors meeting about three days after we closed the Series A. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mann here. Thanks, Dan. So um, I'm Julian, as was already said. And uh, I was getting my co-term uh, in aeronautics and astronautics here when I met Dan and John. Uh, and I was, in particular, working in the Space Systems Development Lab, which has been building these CubeSats that Dan mentioned. Um, and we were really at the stage of them where we were starting to apply them to more and more sophisticated science missions. Uh, and when I wasn't thinking about that, I was trying to figure out how to control the satellites with my iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I sp also spent about a year working at NASA on the manned space program. And it was really in that experience that I realized, oh my god, this technology that we have in the lab has the ability to, to disrupt this massive, massive industry. But we have to figure out a way of getting it away from the academic research grant world and into the you know, serious investment world that will allow us to accelerate the development. Um, and so for me, that was when, after a little false start, chasing some <coughs> government research, small business kind of opportunities, reconnected with Dan and John, and, and Skybox became a reality. Um, but back to the first board meeting. So, there we are sitting in, our, in the closet of, of an office that we have at the time. And I was the, the CTO at the time. And being the good aerospace engineer that I was, I knew that it was my job to, convince that we, or to convey that we had a credible plan for going from concept to satellite on orbit. And that obviously means having a schedule. And more importantly, especially if you're an aerospace engineer, it means having a Gantt chart. So I was sitting there in Excel making a Gantt chart I think I had really great line titles like 1.1, 1.2, 2.2. I think there was a date, or a timeline across the bottom of the chart, but I'm not confident of that. Uh, there were definitely no it was dates annual. with. Yeah, it was, it was, probably annual. No dates within the chart. Maybe some like variable with colored lines. 
Um, and we get into the board meeting and I put up this chart and I start explaining it and I may have gotten two or three sentences in before my first uh, instruction, which was go buy a copy of Microsoft Project and learn how to use it and go buy this very specific book on budget and schedule management and read it cover to cover. And why don't you come back next month and we'll try this again. <laughs> so the lesson of the board meeting is whatever you're doing, you're doing it wrong. Figure it out, improve, keep going. Um, we walked out of the board meeting and you know, ultimately we uh, was prob probably did better than, than we could have and realized now we have to go hire some people. We're trying to build a satellite. We're going to need at least like 10 or 15 engineers to make this whole thing work. Uh, and they're going to need to be from a number of different engineering disciplines. Uh, and it turns out through the process of, of raising the Series A, uh, investors would often ask us, you know, can you give us some examples of the types of people that you're going to go hire? Uh, so we would go to our friends in grad school and say, hey, can you lend us uh, your resume? We just need an example of the type of person, you know, just so we can get across the finish line. We're not trying to convince you to like, leave your PhD or the cushy corporate job you just got. Um, but then suddenly you're sitting there with this long list of positions that you need to fill. And of course, we just immediately turned around and started turning up the heat on them to actually jump ship and, and come join the team. And apparently we must have done something right, because as, as Dan already mentioned, about the first 10 people we hired were all our friends from school. So it uh, turns out hiring your friends when you need to hire fast sometimes actually works. <laughs> um, you know, another thing that, that I think often about in those early days is I'm sure many people in this room have heard, heard the term uh, product market fit and iterating your technology to market. Um, and I, couldn't agree more with, with the necessity to do that. I add one small piece to that maxim, which is rapidly iterate your technology to market, but don't kill your team in the process. Um, and so right as we finished up the Series A financing, we had this reference point design for the satellite. Really, it was a you know, back of the envelope conceptual design saying this might be feasible. And at the time, the satellite was going to produce two, two and a half meter resolution, not quite the quality that, that Dan showed up on the, the pictures of, uh, on the slides a few minutes ago, um, but reasonably good. But we got out there and we started really talking to people and what we found is we probably need something a little better. We probably need to get close, closer down to one meter resolution. Um, and so we began this four or five month process where every two or three days, Dan would walk in the office and say, all right, like we need to figure out how to get just like 5% more performance out of the system. And we were just churning out new designs, new designs, new designs, running you know, this kind of analysis, that kind of analysis. And it was proceeded and satellite kept growing and growing and growing. And, and one day Dan walks in and, and he had the look on his face that I knew meant we need 5% more out of the system. So I grabbed him, took him into the conference room, which was like in the middle of the windowless office and said, Dan, I understand what you're doing. I can take it. But Mike, our VP of Satellite Systems, is going to have a heart attack if you ask for 5% more from the system one more time. And I'm pretty sure that was the last time the system grew. So just don't kill the team in the process of trying to Global do it. Global optimization by watching people's forehead veins. <laughs> um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, is the importance of flirting. And I don't mean in the romantic sense. Um, you know, the technology at Skybox is really based upon the convergence of sort of these two technology pillars, this satellite miniaturization and the now exceedingly buzzword big data that's been swirling around the valley for the last few years. Um, but we knew as we were looking at this that as we launch more and more satellites, the volume of data that we were going to have to be storing and processing and making accessible to our users was going to be increasing incredibly rapidly you know, on, the, on the same type of growth curve as you know, Facebook's photo stores. And we knew that doing that was going to require a lot of, of you know, engineering and ingenuity if we were going to do it in any way differently from the, the traditional guys which spend hundreds of millions of dollars on legacy infrastructure to do this. And our network was pretty, pretty heavily skewed towards the aerospace side, so we knew we had to find some other people. And it turned out that uh, Dan, Dan's wife's friend from work's husband was uh, you know, a, a big data software guy. Um, and so we started talking to him very early on. You know, Come by the office for a beer. Let's uh, help us figure out 
maybe like what do we need to do to think about storing this? How do we think about like backhauling all this data from places like Norway and Fairbanks, Alaska? And you know, that proceeded for a year and the meetings went from, you know, once every two months to once every three weeks. And suddenly, you know, a year later, it's like, all right, you need to join our team to to actually lead up this effort. And that didn't just happen once, that happened all the time. And it didn't just happen with hiring, it happened with, with VCs. The first, the first VC that Dan mentioned that we pitched before we took 273 uh, didn't, didn't participate in the Series A, but became our lead investor in the Series B. So you really never know what relationships you're gonna build early that are gonna bear fruit. And my, my biggest lesson learned from that is think about what skills and assistance and partnerships and support you're going to need, not just today, but tomorrow, and start investing in those relationships early. Because when you do, they will pay huge, huge dividends. Um, and my, my sort of parting thought here is, is on the fact that all it really takes is a simple idea. And with Skybox, it's really easy to sort of get stuck thinking about the fact that we're doing things like building satellites and buying rockets and doing all this stuff around the world. But ultimately, the core idea behind Skybox was really, really simple. We were building satellites that looked and felt like PCs in a satellite world where everybody else was building mainframes. And as we started going out and telling people that story, we realized that, yeah, there's a big opportunity when you dramatically reduce the cost of something and increase its accessibility this is a pattern that, that breeds interesting results. And so we just kept pulling on that thread. I think Dan already used that, that term once. And so all it takes is a simple idea. And if you, if you chase that simple idea and you dream big, and anytime anybody tells you that your idea is stupid and you shouldn't do it, you completely ignore them because you know that what you're doing is absolutely essential and going to change the world, then you have a real possibility at doing it. Keep pursuing it. Hey guys, I'm John, and I'm gonna provide some corollaries to what Julian has mentioned. Uh, but first, a bit of a backstory. Uh, my part of the Skybox story starts with a dream. And uh, you guys might guess what that dream is, but actually I dreamed as a kid, all I ever wanted to be was a fighter pilot. You know, I watched Top Gun and Iron Eagle over and over and over again, that's all I wanted to do. Uh, but, so I went to the Air Force Academy, I, I studied my rear end off, and you know, I got to the point where I was ready to do it. I'm all set, I'm gonna go be a fighter pilot, life is gonna be good. There's one problem, is that my eyesight was pretty poor, so I had laser eye surgery, of course, that's what you do, and that surgery failed. And uh, the three subsequent surgeries trying to fix the damage that was caused that first surgery uh, made it so I could drive but never get in a cockpit. So here I was, Air Force officer that couldn't fly. What was I to do? And, and so that's how I got into the satellite business. I was going to have to fly a desk, a mahogany desk. It might as well be doing satellite stuff. And so I, I got to the point where I, I learned how to build and fly really large, massive satellites for the government. Uh, in fact, my, my last job in the Air Force was I was the guy who went to Capitol Hill and I looked senators and congressmen in the eyes and said, we've got to keep building more big, massive satellites, those mainframe ones that, that Julian referenced. Um, but to be honest, my heart wasn't really in it. It, it. it wasn't really creative or innovative. It was just a lot more of the same. Uh, so I decided I need a little bit of a breather from the military industrial complex. So I, I wrote my business school applications essays to the GSB here, and they were just littered with ref references about how I wanted to start a small satellite company. It, it sounded really good. It read awesome. Um, but <laughs> to be honest, my heart wasn't really in it. I, didn't, I just thought that was a pipe dream. I was all set to go off and go chase mobile apps or whatever else was out here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I thought I was gonna leave the satellite world behind. And it was only after a number of beers and a number of doodles on a cocktail napkin uh, with Julian and Dan and CY where I kinda got back into it and said, you know what, there's a, there's a way to do this differently. And, uh, and, and so that's, it, that's what got me here as part of this team and I, what I'd like to relay is, is two lessons as we've got going that add some sort of pragmatic reality to, to what we're trying to do. Um, you know, Julian says all it takes is a big idea. I would argue that that big, audacious, really hairy goal is necessary, um, but for getting a business going, it's, it's not sufficient. 
You have to find that near-term path to revenue to make the company tick, to make investors happy, to make it all work. And, uh, and there's a, a few stories that we, we learned that lesson the hard way. Uh, right after we incorporated, got our email addresses, as Dan described, the first thing we did, we put on our ties, and we flew right to Wall Street. And we went, opened the door to a hedge fund, and said, guess what we're doing? We're going to do near real-time overhead monitoring from above, everywhere. It's going to be awesome. And then we slid the paper across their desk and just said, you know, just sign here. We're, we're good to go. We're going we're to be partners, right? And, and as you might surmise, there was no deal to be had. Th those guys looked at us and said, yeah, it's cute and all, but come back to us when you're real. Come back to us when you have real data. Well, it turns out that's a real challenge. We're going to get real data from a satellite that was still years away from being reality. So we looked at ourselves and looked at each other and said, well, what do we do? How do we, how do we provide interim proof points in, in a business where the real milestone is putting things in space at, at large cost? You know, it turns out Skybox is a lot more like uh, a medical device company or a semiconductor chip fab in that you put a gazillion dollars in before you get one dollar out and before you have that alpha product. I mean, we're four years in. We still don't have a product, and we're working towards it. So we put our heads together and came up with, well, OK, we're engineers. So we busted out our laptops and started to write you know, in MATLAB, made ourselves some simulated imagery, held that up to customers. Nah, it didn't do much. So then we said, OK, we'll buy up all the satellite imagery that we can find today and, and hold that up to customers. And so, well, just imagine, close your eyes, that instead of six months old, this is one hour old. Instead of a still picture, it's video. And instead of being two grand, it's going to be 20 bucks. It got a little bit of the juices flowing in the customers, but still wasn't enough. So finally, we said, screw it. And we went and bought a Learjet and drilled a hole in the bottom and put a camera to be able to fully replicate what we're going to see from space. Well, that, that helped, actually, quite a bit. Uh, and it was pretty fun in, in, in the process. Um, and, and so in doing so, as we finally got out and engaged with a bunch of customers, we realized that the people that were going to work with us initially weren't those hedge funds. They, it was a bridge too far. It turns out that the folks that were most interested, had the most pain today that we could help solve, were international organizations and governments that didn't really want to go through the hassle of putting up, designing, and flying spacecraft themselves. They just wanted to borrow time on our first or second spacecraft as it flew over their territory. And that was, for us, it was a big shock. We, we, didn't, we didn't appreciate that fully until having gone through the process of identifying and creating that, that proxy product. That's the first lesson that from a takeaway from us. The second one is that, as a startup, you, we, we always were completely resource constrained. Each one of us was trying to do 10 different jobs and getting swamped in all of them. And going out there to do uh, research about where the customers were and the like uh, was just a real challenge. With this satellite imagery, it's useful for you know, billions of different applications. But picking that subset that is most lucrative, most important for us, especially in the near term, was, was a real challenge. Uh, so we decided to focus on those set of customers that were so excited about what we were doing, they were willing to educate us about how they were going to use it along the way. And at, at the start, those first few customers, those early adopters, we found to be so valuable. We gave them a sweetheart deal. You know, they're, they've got their hooks into us, but it's okay because we're learning a ton about what they need, and it's really informing our product development process. And the second thing that we've done is, from the get-go, we've really focused on building a platform whereby people can access our data on a self-serve basis. Now, I know platform in Silicon Valley is a total buzzword. Everyone says it. But it turns out we need to do it just to be able to expose this all to third parties to be able to figure out you know, where is the killer app in, in this type of data stream. We haven't figured it out yet, but we think by letting everyone play in this sandbox, that great things will come out of it. Um, and so, so with that, I, I'd like to just cl close my piece by saying that Skybox, the challenge for us in making this big idea a reality is that we're trying to put a lot of things together. 
We're designing and manufacturing spacecraft. We're launching and flying them. We are putting together a huge data infrastructure. We're doing crazy image processing algorithms and a UI to be able to have folks play with the data. So it's really, Skybox is more like five or six startups in one. Um, so CY, uh, is, pass it over to you to talk about how do we take those five startups and turn it into something real. Sounds good, thanks John. Well, first off, it's great to be here. Um, I was listening to ETL lectures two years before I even applied to Stanford, uh, which is 2005. So this is just incredibly humbling to be back here to, to share stories from uh, Stanford to a space startup. And uh, unlike the other three, uh, I'm the only non-rocket scientist of the team. Um, I went to Berkeley undergrad, studied statistics and operational research, came directly here for my master's in management science and engineering, and I met Dan, John, and Julian in MSNE 273. And uh, for those of you who haven't taken it, um, you work in teams of four, and they teach you uh, the basics of how to build a tech startup. And this was my last quarter at Stanford, and my worst calamity was to waste my last few months at Stanford just working on a normal project of mediocre aspirations. And so I knew going into the class that I didn't want to work with the talented team, but I just wanted to work with the best. And so on the first day, the class was oversubscribed, and the professor said, you have to raise your hand and say something in order to, to stay in it. And uh, you know, many of the students started raising their hands and saying, you know, um, brainstorming ideas around iPhone apps and mobile, social, and local ideas. And uh, the three boys were sitting in the back, and I remember Dan rose his hand and said, hi, I'm Dan. I'm going to launch a constellation of bread box sized satellites to analyze the Earth in real time. And he said it so emphatically, I was just shocked. And you know, John you know, later says, you know, I'm going to you know, uh, create a company to deliver pizzas via helicopter. And the class erupted in laughter. And I thought to myself, well, that's a really cheeky comment, but you have to be smart to be cheeky. And so passion is a really infectious thing, um, is what you'll find. And I felt that all the way at the front of the room where I was sit sitting. And after the first class uh, adjourned, I literally ran up to them. And I said, hi, I'm Ching Yu. I'd like to be part of your team. And to which I said, who are you? I think you? it was more, I'm Ching Yu. I'm going to be I'm part of your team. I'm going to be part of your team. <laughs> yeah, there's an imperative there. Um, and uh, you know, I've always been a really soft-spoken and kind of a reserved person. And to this day, I'm just so shocked that I was so bold and so utterly shameless to actually go up to these guys and pretty much take no for an answer. And it wasn't until later that I realized that actually all four of us are really good at not taking no for an answer. Um, and so, you know, after we uh, uh, left Stanford, you know, we spent a couple glorious months in uh, John's living room. And when we got funded, I mean, we were just so fired up to just do whatever it took to take a graded business plan into an actual business. And so, uh, you know, um, one of the things that we really learned when we moved into that a windowless office that Dan was talking about with termites falling on our customers, <laughs> we learned how to be scrappy and we reveled in it. Um, most of the furniture that we got was from the cheapest um, office liquidation um, sales that we could find on Craigslist. We found a free eight-foot conference table um, that we spent the better half of an afternoon trying to shuttle down a parking lot on a skateboard. Um, our refrigerator came from one of the dorms here on Stanford that had rainbow color mold that Dan and I, you know, cleaned out. When we went to conferences, we would call them and say, we're Stanford grads and um, we can't afford this $3,000 ticket, can we get it for 50? And most of the time we would get discounts like that and generally speaking, you'll just be surprised um, what you'll get when you just, just ask. Um, and, you know, one of the things that um, was, uh, we learned was when you have a company with a really, really big vision. Um, it really helps to kind of surpass roadblocks just to learn how to adopt a very healthy disrespect for seemingly impossible tasks. And for us, like nothing was too big. Um, we needed regulatory licenses to uh, launch satellites. And so we called our attorneys, we talked to our advisors, figured out how to do it, and went out and got it done. Uh, we needed an optical payload, and so um, we were able to convince one of the world's leading providers of high-performance optics to design and build um, the payload for the constellation. Uh, we needed market validation for financing, and we went out and cold-called 350 customers, um, you know, and uh, showed traction where we could. Um, and uh, you know, people always ask us if um, the four of us had drama or we fought. And the fact is, we were just too busy. Um, we just, and John, remember when he had swine flu? He still came to work when he had swine flu. We had to put a tape around his desk so <laughs> no one would get too close to him. It was like a biohazard <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Stay home if you have swine flu, <laughs> by the way. It wasn't worth it. 
Um, and you know, one of the challenges that we faced has been learning how to scale the culture. Um, you know, when it was just 12 of us in the small Palo Alto office, we always had a pulse on what was going on just by the sheer number of hours that we spent together in very confined spaces. And I was the only girl and 13 guys. But you know, how do you think about scaling transparency and collaboration and creativity when you're now 85 people and you have new engineers and new executives and new advisors and you've never worked with any of them before? And one of the things that we realized was that we had an opportunity to completely change what it meant to be an aerospace company. So traditional aerospace, they're very risk averse, they're very bureaucratic, and they're largely beholden to meeting the, the um, specs of the US government. And at Skybox, we like to say we're bringing the Silicon Valley approach to aerospace. And we're building satellites like uh, Silicon Valley companies build agile software. And we're always using the latest and greatest technologies and just iterating really fast. And one of the ways we've tried to reinforce that culture is just to hire people that are just from very diverse backgrounds, give them an environment to innovate that's kind of un unencumbered of traditional aerospace. And so if you walk through our office, you'll walk through our engineering bullpen, you'll see aerospace engineers that are working on space qualified hardware. And they're sitting next to software engineers that are building out data mining and uh, computer al algorithms. And you know, from the engineering bullpen to our class 10,000 clean room, um, where our system engineers are integrating components on our two satellites, you might trip over a dog or get hit by a Nerf gun. And another thing that we were really um, focused on was uh, learning how to scale our transparency. It was really important to us. And so uh, every Sunday night, uh, Dan sends out an email to the entire team outlining the five challenges, five goals, and accomplishments for the past and following week. Uh, on Mondays, we have our all hands where we celebrate anniversaries for all our employees, introduce new ones, and give uh, updates across the departments. Um, and after each board meeting, we actually brief the entire board package to the entire team. And so it was really important that we were briefing the board exactly what we're briefing the employees. And so everybody knows what our key milestones, our challenges, our risks, even our cash position. And we're moving so fast that we can't afford to have restricted information flows. So we always err on a full disclosure. And, and finally, if you look at the people at Skybox, um, you know, we've just for, been really, really fortunate just to have just an amazing collection of people from RF engineers to UI software engineers. And if you look at why they actually joined Skybox, it wasn't because of pay. I mean, some of our employees uprooted their kids from high schools to relocate across the country. They dropped out of their PhDs. And you know, we really were able to hire people on the basis that we would provide them a very unique, once in a lifetime uh, journey to revolutionize the way that businesses make decisions and people view the world. Uh, we were able to hire people based on the fact that we could give engineers the opportunity to build software and hardware and infrastructure to build something that actually goes into space, it moves at 7,000 miles per hour and beams down a terabyte of data per day. And I think you know, we're, we're just getting started and uh, we still have a very long way to go to, to prove uh, um, ourselves. But I think that you know, the four of us will look back in about 10 years and we'll really judge how well we've done based on how we've scaled our culture. And I think if we get that right, everything else will follow. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Dan. All right, wow. That's a hard one to follow up, Ching Yu. <laughs> um, you know, I think in conclusion, you know, one, of the, one of the biggest lessons for us and really what kind of all these lessons adds up to is that you know, it's a, it's, it is not a specific point or milestone. You know, this really is a journey. If you make the decision to leave the walls of Stanford and go out and actually try and create a company, you have to be open to the journey of growing from being an entrepreneur to, you know, to an executive, to an operator, to someone that is out in the field and is doing it. And that is a hard transition. And it doesn't take days or weeks or months, it takes years. And it takes really a, a dogged determination to continue challenging yourself and the people around you. And on one hand, to, as Ching Yu said, not, be, not let people tell you no for an answer, but at the same time, you know, knowing when to be open to changing your own assumptions, the way you look at the world, you, the way you look at the people around you, and the way that you look at yourself. And so um, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that you know, we are four good examples of, of people that have made the first few steps on that journey. We still have a long way to go, um, absolutely. But you know, Skybox for us has been a journey of a lifetime already. And you know, our emails are just our first names at skybox.com. You know, if you are interested in joining us or working on data analysis or you know, trying to get outside of uh, the walls of Stanford and you know, getting a little bit more of a, a taste of what we're doing, you know, please reach out to us. You know, we come and do these things because 
We want to meet more people. We want to get our names out there. And um, like Julian put it, we're always looking for the next person that's going to move the needle for Skybox in the future. You know, so please uh, reach out to us and come find us. With that, we'll open it up for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to pick who asks questions? All right, fire away. Yes, you can What are the legal challenges for putting your satellites into space? John. 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 <laughs> this, we talked about the pitch. Uh, this is the question that John always answered in the always. Series A pitch that came up every single one of the 150 pitches yeah. that we did. And, and, and to refresh my memory, you said the legal challenges? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it, it turns out uh, space is fairly heavily regulated. Funnily that. Uh, we need to get a license from the US government in order to be able to sell pictures commercially from space. And now the beauty of that license is space is treated kind of like Antarctica. It's free for everybody. Um, we have restrictions as to who we can sell to. Uh, there are a few countries and a few individuals, uh, bad people, that we can't sell to. Uh, but it, we do have uh, the ability to uh, sell our imagery to most places on Earth uh, and take pictures of most places on Earth. And you know, it's funny that Stanford, especially the business school, talks about um, being a, you know, creating global businesses. <laughs> well, Skybox, just by its very nature, it, it, we're, we're global. Um, we're also global in terms of how we put our satellites into space. Uh, our first satellite will launch on a converted Russian nuclear missile uh, out on the border of Russia and Kazakhstan. And how they do this is they literally take the warheads out and they put our satellite in and a drill with four bolts, they go zzz, 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 <laughs> and off we go. Uh, and so there are also tons of challenges there. There's a lot there. of paperwork to get to that. An amazing yeah. amount of paperwork to get to that. Yeah, and, and speaking of the paperwork, you know, working with the U.S. government to make sure that our regulators are comfortable with us taking you know, relatively advanced technology over there for that it, it has also been a big challenge for us. So what that means is I've spent a lot of time in D.C. over the last four years. Yes, in the back. Um, you mentioned near real time. What barriers are there to getting it real-time? Or do you see there being a, a real-time equivalent of Google Earth or Google Maps in the future on that? I think that's a, that's a great question. You know, what, what is the sort of future of satellite imagery? How real-time can this actually be? Um, you know, part of that is a little bit like Google sitting back in 1996 saying, how big can the internet be? I mean, the simple idea was we want to index the internet. You know, and they probably had no idea at the time just how far that simple idea could take them. You know, and I think you know, in our case, the, the timeliness of the imagery is a direct function of the number of satellites you have. Right? So that's, that's why we're building lots of smaller satellites, because we want to get to that timeliness. And you know, in reality, we, we could take that a very long way. You know, for us, the, the tipping point, really what we see as a line in the sand, is having enough satellites up that we're able to, um, to offer relatively high confidence to customers that we could get them daily data, you know, something they can use to make a decision every day. And that's, that's really the North Star that we're aiming at right now. But you know, how much farther could this go beyond that? Um, we'll all just have to wait and see together. Yes, in the back. Uh, how much is your the weight of your payload, and you see your weight of your payload increasing or decreasing, and what's the line, largest line item cost? Is it the launch cost? So actually, um, it turns out that uh, satellites and satellite launches are expensive, uh, even when you're trying to do uh, a lower cost version of them. You know, one of the things that's been important for us at Skybox is to reduce costs while not sacrificing uh, competence and quality. Right? And so we follow very stringent, sort of um, very industry standard procedures when it comes to the validation and the testing and the deployment of our satellites. And so um, you know, our, our current payload may increase a little bit over time, but you know, the size of that payload drives the quality of the image that you see here. And so really we are focused on putting up more satellites so that we can drive that timeliness versus putting up bigger satellites so that we can see better pictures. Yes. Uh, 
I'm just wondering because you mentioned that the engineers really have to do basically everything all together. So I'm wondering if you, if the company can actually create an environment for the other, other companies elsewhere to actually compete and reduce the price, or you know, to compete to produce some of the accessories or whatever uh, hardware for you, so that you don't really have to do everything by yourself. Jing Yu, do you want to take there, that one? Julian, you can take the supply chain. <clears throat> so I think if I understand the question co correctly, um, it was, can we create an environment where we allow other companies to sort of compete on building pieces of our technology, pieces of our platform, and, and by effect reducing our internal costs? Um, and the answer is absolutely. We already do uh, you know, take, take advantage of best of breed commercially available technologies when, when they're available. Uh, and if we have to build something ourselves, we do. Um, at the same time, people have often asked us, you know, even when we were raising money, what are you guys going to do when someone else can build a satellite at a lower cost than you can? And my answer has consistently been, we'll buy it from them. Because ultimately for us, you know, we view Skybox will be a success when we're, we are the access point for providing people the information that they need based upon the imagery and other data that we collect. And if there is a you know, lower cost way to do it with someone else's satellite, whether it means bringing in UAVs or balloons or cell phone cameras, you know, ultimately it's all about providing somebody the answer to the question that they have, not necessarily about Skybox being the one that mm -hmm. owns the specific piece of technology in that entire stack. Yes. Yeah, so how do you view competition from aerial imaging based on airplanes and helicopters? Which are much lower cost, much faster to deploy. You said you drilled a Learjet. Right, yeah, right. yeah. We, we did drill a hole in the bottom of a Learjet. That yeah. was funny. Um, yeah, the question was, how do we view potential competition from other collection sensors, from UAVs, from airplanes, and the like? And I think, you know, this is kind of a follow-on to what Julian just said. I mean, we, we really don't view ourselves as having competitors. I mean, we, it sounds kind of cliche, but I mean, we see this as a, a partner industry. I mean, we realize that you know, these applications of tomorrow will not be created based on Skybox data alone. They'll require data from other satellites. They'll require data from airplanes. They'll require data from the ground. And in some cases, getting data from a UAV that you can pop up locally, can loiter in real time, you know, and combining that with some of our information is going to be the best way to solve the problem. If you're trying to get you know, new information on what's happening uh, you know, in, a, in a very distant part of the world, you know, it, it becomes very hard to send a UAV there. And you know, having that global satellite that's constantly coming overhead everywhere on Earth you know, is going to be the way to solve that. So for us, it's about the data integration in the end. And how do we allow you know, everyone's data to kind of come together and to be used in a way that, that solves these big questions uh, in a way we can't today. Yes, yeah, How many satellites gives you daily data? And how much does it cost to get one up in the sky? So we're a little quiet still publicly on what it costs. You know, and um, and the, the truth of the matter is that it's slightly variable on how many satellites you need to actually be able to kind of guarantee that daily revisit. You know, roughly speaking, six satellites of, of our size are, have the opportunity to see anywhere on Earth once a day. But then you think about places that are cloudy. You know, these satellites come over at the same time every day. So they're in what's called a sun-synchronous orbit. So San Francisco, it can be a little hard to collect at 9.30 in the morning, right? So when you put more of these satellites in, instead of six, you say you have 12 or 18 or 24, and you're able to come over at different times of day, then you have the ability to uh, shoot around clouds more, and you also have the ability to service multiple customers that all have competing needs in the same region. So that's, you know, those, that's the order of scale that, you know, again, back to that kind of current North Star we're pointing towards. Can you paint a picture of some of the applications for this? I mean, clearly it's very broad. Uh, yeah, it's, if you want a funny, uh, if you want to have a funny conversation with somebody, like sit them down in an office like John was saying with the hedge funds and say, okay, guess what? You can see anywhere on the earth at any time, you know, what do you do with it, right? And for most people, that's a pretty big, there's a pretty big leap from that concept to what they do on their daily basis sitting at, you know, their computer terminal, right? And so, um, the, there are kind of different classes of applications that really excite us. You know? and, I, and I think that 
Number one, you know, environmentally, being able to understand kind of broadly you know, across the planet what's happening with, with crops, with water, with, with forestry, with things that you know, impact you know, life for all of us here on Earth, but also have a major impact on, um, on supply chains you know, that require natural resources and, um, and on the prices of things like commodities. I, mean, I think that's a very interesting sort of rich data source that is not well understood today. Um, the other kind of general class of problems for us is what we call asset monitoring. It's just being able to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a manager here in the United States that's responsible for something that's being built in a factory overseas. You know, I, how do I audit them? How do I understand what's actually happening? Somebody told me there's a factory there. But is there? Are there trucks outside of it? Are there actually things happening there that would indicate that they're making the parts that I asked them to make? Um, I can get on a plane and fly over there. Maybe I can call somebody on the phone, or I can say, you know, show me what's been going on the last week. So those are the types of things that, you know, the specifics of, you know, which industry and which type of information. I mean, you know, you can break those into a million different pieces, but th those kind of general ideas are the ones that really excite us. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I just I'll add a little bit to Dan's comment. You know, one of the things that we're really excited about are the applications for humanitarian. I mean, imagine having real-time video over anywhere on Earth right after an earthquake. So you'll be able to deploy relief agencies optimally. You can't do that today um, with existing satellites because of the timeliness is not there. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely be uh, looking out for that next year. So. Yes, in the front. Hi. Um, I was wondering about the different controlling interests in the company. Do you guys have founders still have a controlling interest? And if not, how do you deal with the bureaucracy and the different <coughs> controlling interests while you still retain innovation? Um, I, I think part of that question boils back down to that kind of journey that I talked about, you know, and being willing to kind of accept events as they unfold because they're going to be different for every company, right? You know, fundamentally, it is tough to go out and build a very capital intensive business, right? You know, it requires a lot of everything, a lot of people, a lot of money, a lot of different types of expertise, you know, a lot of parties at the table. You know, it, we're strong believers that you know, in doing that creates a much larger opportunity as well, and that's what gets us excited. But um, you know, I always urge people to really think about, if you're gonna go start a company, really think about what you want your life to be like the next five years. You know, is it more important for you to, you know, to have, you know, be with your social circle, kind of working in an environment that you completely control, but might be a, you know, might be a much smaller idea? Or are you really excited by you know, going after the big swing, the big idea, even if there's going to be other things that come along with that you know, that you're going to have to grow up and get used to? And you know, for us, that go, the opportunity, that once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, that people, we've been fortunate enough that people have given us to go out there and really try and do something big was, um, was well worth it. I'll just throw one additional piece on that that I like to tell people, which is, the sort of numerical concept of, of controlling interest is in a lot of ways a fallacy because as soon as you bring on outside, <clears throat> outside investors, it doesn't matter if you're you know, somehow able to do it and only sold them 2% of the company, you now have outside investors and you no longer have a, a complete controlling interest. You have to be working around the table and figuring out ways to you know, bring everybody's opinions and decisions to bear. Uh, my question is, how did you fund the company before getting your Series A? You had to get an airplane and make a hole and take those pictures to get the data <coughs> to get that initial funding. So how were you able to bootstrap that the first part? Credit cards. <laughs> Saving his accounts. <laughs> yeah, credit cards. The Learjet was after the Series The Learjet company. was after. Yeah. <laughs> None of us have yeah. a credit line like that. Do not have that credit card. No. Black card. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you add credit cards? And how many did each of you hold? No, I didn't, I didn't add any credit cards, you guys? No. We actually didn't spend that much, I mean, to be quite honest. You know, for us, we, you know, we were buying tickets to DC and back. That was, we were taking the red eye, you know, so we weren't staying in hotels. And then we John- We sleeping on couches. Yeah, John would rent us a 20 foot long Buick Saber that cost $8 a day to rent or something like that. <laughs> We'd stay in the you know, $30 a night hotel that Three to a room. Three to a room. Yeah. I wasn't in the same room. <laughs> she wasn't in the same room. That's true. That's a good point. It's important for the historical record. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So, have you guys faced any sort of opposition from like inflamed 
privacy advocates? And if so, how do you, I guess, reposition Skyblocks when you're talking to people about it? So we really haven't, haven't to date. Um, and I think a big reason to that has to do with what Dan was talking about earlier and that <clears throat> at the resolution that we're at, there's really a certain level of inherent anonymity. You know, we're not looking at people's license plates. You're not gonna get accidentally caught walking out of the front, the front door of your house. It's more about understanding, you know, the, the slower movements of larger objects mm -hmm. that, that indicate, you know, macroeconomic or macro security trends. Um, and I think the other, the other piece as well is, gets to the application side stuff that Ching Yu was talking about in that, you know, the, the public's widest exposure to satellite imagery, I think, other than Google Earth, which is really old and static, but as far as public, public's exposure to new satellite imagery, is when there's a earthquake in Haiti, or there's a, you know, a nuclear reactor and tsunami in Japan, and suddenly we're using this data to understand you know, impact to human life, come up with, with security plans, come up with response plans, and it becomes, in some ways a lot easier to, to you know, allay certain concerns and you say, look at the amazing things that we'll be able to enable for humanity with a greater access to this data. Yeah, and I think that's really a lot of that comes down to resolution. You know, we've, we have purposefully chosen to pursue a business that really does not have the sort of image resolution, you know, to be able to, to go down to that micro level. You know, we want to be about the macro level and in a world where you know, there's Street View in a world where there's the Twitter real-time feed in a world where there's Facebook. You know, we feel that we're actually, you know, we're, we're not going down to that sort of same level that, that gets to some of those privacy concerns. Last question. Make it a good one, Ching Yu. All right. <laughs> Could you talk a little more about what it was like working with each other in the beginning, like three male and female? You guys clearly feed off each other's energy right now, but what was it like in the very beginning, and how has that kind of culture and dynamics evolved over time? Ching Yu, I think that one's all you. Yeah, no, it, it was, it's been glorious. It really has. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so lucky that these guys actually let me be part of the team. <laughs> And you know the, the four of us really you know work really well together. We're extremely different people. We have different personalities, different temperaments, and you know we all do very different things, um, but are just able to to get a lot a lot of things done. And we were fortunate because we had that dating period in the class, where you figure out really quickly: Do you want to travel around the world with these guys and spend a long hours with them? Do they raise your thinking? Do they elevate your you know thought? And for me, it was absolutely yes. Um, I'm sure you will agree that this was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> Join me in thanking this wonderful team. Thank you.